Hi everybody, it's Kathy here from IMCO, from the Inter International Integrative Maternity Healthcare Organisation. And welcome to this week's webinar, our Maternity Natural Health webinar. And I can see the numbers are starting to sign on in here. So welcome, welcome. And our esteemed guest today is Tony Harmon. Tony, have a, say hello. Uh, hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk all things microbial with you. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, boy, you're a pretty well-known person these days, Tony. You've been so um, effective with getting the message out, which is really great. Um, and so now everybody just signing in, would you, we'd love you to go into the chat if you could and just let us know whereabouts you are in the world and um, your health professional role, or maybe you're a mum who is expecting, um, but just do let us know, go into the chat, let us know where you are. Also, just a reminder that down the bottom of the screen is the Q&A button. So if you've got any questions for Tony, um, please just put them in there and we'll absolutely make sure that we'll get those answered um, before we wind up today. And today is going to be um, a, a bit of a casual chat. Um, we've got a, I certainly got a bunch of questions that um, I know we, we all want to ask and, um, and throw your questions in there too. So... Oh, we've got some chats coming through. Um, oh, we've got a lot of New Zealanders on here today, which is fantastic. That's cool. Um, and uh, yeah, well, we're having our, our internationals coming through soon as well. Yes, here we go. That's wonderful. All right. So welcome, welcome, everybody. And um, so you'll all... Um, no, ta uh, well, most of you, I would imagine, are familiar with Tony Harmon, and she was a um, graduate from the London Film School, um, and she's become, you know, quite well known for her directorship of the movie Microbirth, um, and uh, how your baby's microbiome affects uh, its well-being. And today we're going to be talking particularly. Um, around that whole critical role of um, the vaginal birth and breastfeeding and creating that optimum um, immune training. So welcome, welcome, Tony. Honestly, I love it. I, I could talk about microbes and uh, the infant microbiome and birth and breastfeeding. Honestly, I think I say the word vagina must be <laughs> hundred times a day. Either write it or say it. <laughs> It's so funny, you know, and I, I remember in 2014, 2015, when the movie, your movie came out and you did had the whole world opening, you know, and I remember sitting in the cinema along with a whole lot of other midwives going, wow, you know, this is such groundbreaking stuff. And, and you know, then it was something we hadn't really heard of. And, and now it's something that we're so much more familiar with. And, and you know, you, you realize that you're almost ripping that woman off when she doesn't get, you know, the baby doesn't get access. So um, what a, you know, a, a, an amazing amount of education that you have accomplished throughout the world and really only half a decade you've made a huge impact so um tell us your backstory um you know what led you to making microbirth um you know and then of course you've got your online school now uh where people can you know birth practitioners can learn more about it so tell us a little bit about the history uh firstly well thank you for um thank you for having me on here I'm, I'm <laughs> Um, but also thank you for saying nice things about our film and about kind of what we've done. I mean, I'm, I'm on this mission to uh, to spread the word about the infant microbiome. So um, I've only just begun. You just watch. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yes. um, okay, so um, 13 years ago, I was pregnant and uh, I was visualizing a, uh, a home water birth surrounded by lovely midwives with music and candles um, and I wanted to exclusively breastfeed and that was in my head that was in my birth plan and uh, it's like yep yeah, that's kind of I'd read everything and was really well prepared I was like that's what I wanted and like quite often happens with birth uh, I ended up with an emergency c-section and then within about an hour of giving birth this um and I don't know who she was, but uh, some sort of maternity support worker gave my baby um, formula milk within an hour of, 
of her being born. So my newborn baby, when I struggled to breastfeed, was given infant formula. And uh, so I kept, I kept trying to breastfeed and I did breastfeed, but I um, wor worried that she wasn't getting enough. I, I topped up with formula. And I know that my story is a story of millions of people all around the mm -hmm. world. And it's just um, some, something that happens. And uh, now I realize that uh, it didn't have to happen like that or, or I should have been more involved in the choices. And so that's what, what drives me forward. Okay, so I had this, um, this birth experience and then I started uh, thinking about making films. As I was already a filmmaker, we'd just finished our first um, uh, feature film that um, um, was released by a Hollywood studio. It was a, it was a horror film. And, uh, and so myself and my partner, we just, we were already filmmakers. We've made, been making films for years. Um, and we started thinking what, you know, what's, what had just happened there? We were on this path to have a, a kind of home water birth and then ended up with an emergency C-section and not exclusively breastfeeding. What was the, what happened? So we kind of started interviewing people and started asking, and we went to Strasbourg to mid midwifery today and, uh, I, made a, I met some doulas and we made a film about doulas and then um, got into the politics of birth and made a film about the human rights in childbirth and um, informed consent. And uh, we had the film, that, that film was uh, Freedom for Birth and it ended up with this huge, um, we had all these screenings all around the world and there was a, a real strong reaction to it as in a uh, brilliant reaction as in lots of people really liked it, but also lots of people really didn't like it was a I mean, question oh, oh you, you expect the controversy chord i know and and because i thought who could argue against human rights in childbirth who would mm -hmm. that I, I just couldn't see the counter argument if you mm -hmm. make a film about informed consent for women who would be against informed consent turns out there's a lot of people <laughs> against informed consent who knew so, um, so uh, we were getting uh, dozens of emails and messages and everything else. It was all kind of really, really heated and angry. So it's like, right, let's take a step back and let's look at the science of birth. And um, we started, well, originally we were making a film about epigenetics, but when we started filming, um, making this film about epigenetics, um, we were filming these brilliant scientists who said, the most exciting thing about epigenetics is we just don't know. And uh, to, to a scientist, like, we just don't know is brilliant because it means that they've got loads of things to investigate. Find out. Mm. To a filmmaker, we just don't know isn't something you could kind of, an audience could get behind because so that, and so then we started hearing about the microbiome. Um, in fact, Hannah Darlin from um, uh, University of Western Sydney, uh, she emailed and said, I've just, um, I've just read this paper, which I think is really, really interesting. Um, and you should take a look at it anyway. So we, um, we started looking into the microbiome and started interviewing scientists. So that's how we're going to make microbirth. And then it was, it was like this, this light going off in our heads. So when I talk about me, it's, it's, it's myself and my partner, Alex. So imagine him sitting here. So it's like me. <laughs> Uh, we uh, um, we have a company, Alto Films. So he's Alex and I'm Tony. So we're Alto mm -hmm. Films. Um, so it's this light going off. It, it, it was kind of, this is the science that really strongly supports vaginal birth and breastfeeding. And this is the science that is invisible, but it can make a real difference to lifelong health. So um, it's kind of been a bit of a journey. And, you know, 15 years ago, 13 years ago, when I was pregnant with my baby, I had no idea that I'd be making yeah. documentary about, about no idea my, you're going to end up this um, you know world-renowned person specializing in vaginal <laughs> microbiome. You know, yeah. I knew actually the, the moment when I thought um, this is this is kind of what I'm supposed to be doing. I was in a I'd just given a talk to um, uh, this. Um, there was a big audience, about 500, 600 people in Germany. And uh, I was being simultaneously translated into, um, I think, five different languages. So there's like Russian, English, uh, um, so it was in German. So it's being translated into Germany, German, uh, Czech Republic, I think French, Spanish, so, so lots of different languages. 
So I'd say something and laugh at my own joke. And then it'd be silence in the auditorium. And then about 10 seconds later, people would laugh. And it's <laughs> Anyway, so at the moment I, I, I was um, in the lift afterwards, um, this, uh, this elder gentleman who must have been kind of 80 came up to me and just said, uh, very good talk, Miss Harmon, very, very good talk, thank you very much. He said, I've never heard the word vaginal juices before. Um, <laughs> he said, I will use it often. <laughs> so, uh, honestly, and I just thought, oh my God, this is what I'm meant to do. I'm meant to say vaginal juices. Because <laughs> everybody understands what that means. <laughs> that's a, well, that's the thing, you know, so not, well, not just vaginal juices, fecal juices, you know, so, you know, vaginal juices and fecal matter is, uh, that's it. That's become your specialty and who would have known? <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, so tell us about, um, the infant microbiome so we if so i'm imagining that quite a few people who are watching have heard of it uh maybe they know quite a bit about it they've perhaps studied um under your training or it's just a word and they really aren't fully understanding of what that is yet so maybe if we kind of go over what that stands for what it means okay so <laughs> the human mm -hmm. microbiome is a, a, a word, a phrase that it covers all the communities of microbes that live on and in your body. So you have bacteria, um, viruses, fungi, um, archaea, protests, lots of these microorganisms that live on and in you. So they're in your nose, your mouth, your eyes, your ears, your, uh, if you're lucky enough to be a woman, in your side, your vagina. And in, most importantly, if you imagine a pipe running from your mouth to your bum um, and that's your kind of gut and most of the microbes are at the tail end of your gut and scientists are discovering that there's um, these microbes mostly in your gut are really well microbes everywhere but particularly mm. in your gut um, are really important for human health so things like they help with digestion they help with metabolism with your immune system they help keep your body running and functioning. And it's all done by kind of chemical signals between the microbes and other, other the other kind of organs. And, you know, so, um, and they've also discovered there's a, a gut brain connection. So um, somehow the, the, the microbes in your gut influence your workings of your brain. So your whole body, um, and, and like, so if you imagine your body is part human, so there's all these human cells, there's also part microbes um, so that you are not because I used to think I was Tony that was it turns mm -hmm. out part of me is Tony which is the human part of it but I've got all these other trillions of Tonys <laughs> trillions of these microbes inside me on me and uh, are part of me so I'm not a one person I'm an us all these and I, 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 I think <laughs> what, what I love about it is that um, what the my I have a cloud of microbes, right? Everybody yeah. has a cloud of microbes around you. Um, if I walk somewhere, my cloud of microbes follow me, um, and I leave a trace of microbes everywhere I go. So if I get in somebody's car, my cloud of microbes come in the car with me, and I leave some of my microbes there. So so a scientist could scan the the car and find out identify my microbes because everyone's got a unique microbiome identify that as me or if Gosh. i so if i was a burglar and broke in somewhere i would mm -hmm. leave my microbial trace in wherever i go so if you think oh about God, all those it's like a fingerprint exactly so um like think about some old churches or those old buildings you know imagine if you swabbed you know if you swabbed all the walls you'd find the microbial fingerprint of everybody's been in there you know this whole you know the whole sort of covid thing the whole pandemic if mm. you're sitting in a in a restaurant um and this is the negative side so if you're sitting in a restaurant the people around you in that restaurant could be infected with it well that's the thing because they're this part of your cloud yeah. you know so yeah. so it's kind of okay so it's it's, it's communicated by um uh but you know airborne 
or if you're coughing and everything else, but it's it, it's there, it's around you. So that's the negative side, that a tiny fraction of, of microbes can be harmful, but most are really beneficial or harmless. And how does the woman's microbiome change during her pregnancy? So the mother's, so there's her mother's vaginal microbiome changes. So then you get more of a particular type of um, bacteria. So lactobacilli. Mm -hmm. And they're a lactic acid um, bacteria closely related to breast milk. So you, you end up having more lactobacillus in your, um, in your vagina, which makes the, the, the environment more acidic, which means that um, and it, they crowd out the pathogens. So it makes it, so it kind of prepares the vagina for vagina birth vaginal birth and also there's um, uh, some changes in your gut so in the microbiome in your gut and um, and this this is kind of emerging area so what are the changes and what does it actually mean so so this is kind of what scientists are thinking and there's needs more proof and normal research but they, they, there's evidence that there's more quick energy releasing microbes in the gut um, sort of uh, uh, during pregnancy and the hypothesis is that um, when a baby is born, it needs access to quick energy. So that they mm -hmm. kind of, these microbes help the baby get those, that, that kind of quick release of energy. So before, before the baby's like fed and, and kind of gets the like nutrients from, from the breast milk. So it's this idea that your, your, the mother's body is changing during pregnancy in preparation for birth and um, birth and breastfeeding it's amazing it's amazing yeah and it's i mean there's so many parts of of her physiology that changes other than her womb growing um you know and so of course it would make sense that those invisible changes happen as well that it's as you say it's not just your body it's the all those little micro bodies that are part of your body um of, of course it would make sense that they change so then what happens um, for the baby during birth for their microbiome? Um, because they're basically born with a sterile gut and then instantly it's, it, it's starting to get exposed, isn't it? So how it's does what that, how, what's the research showing on all of that? So it's, it's not... So this is a kind of a, a question of debate amongst mm -hmm. scientists and there's different camps. So some people think that there is a, the baby is born with a sterile gut. Some people think that the, there might be some exposure, a small amount of exposure to microbes during pregnancy. Um, right. The baby okay. is gross, develops in the, at, in the amniotic sac, which is um, kind of mostly protects the baby from, mm -hmm. from microbes, but there may be some, some exposures kind of in utero. So it, it, there's kind of, I keep reading all these papers, like, is there, isn't there? And if there is, then it could be that those prenatal exposures are kind of preceding, are kind of sets up yes. the right conditions for what happens next. So it kind of starts to, to it's like an appetite, appetizers for a meal, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like, it's like your muse bouche, you might have a kind of bit of, kind of bit of something just to kind of whet your appetite and get everything going um, before your main meal comes. So when the amniotic sac ruptures so the sort of the rupture of, of membranes which which uh you know midwives would know and yeah. um, that yeah. usually happens um at the start of or sometime during labor the, the the amniotic sac will split open and suddenly the baby is now fully exposed to the world of microbes yeah. so the baby acquires microbes from the mother's vagina um and as the baby passes through the birth canal, it like sucks up all those microbes. And if you imagine it's a little bit of a squeeze coming through there. So all those microbes are pushed into the skin and in the mouth and in the nose. And you, some of those are swallowed. And yeah. then uh, this is, a, this is a, like the fun bit. So as the baby comes out um, through the vagina and uh, the, the physiology of birth is such that the baby is likely to have... Um, contact with the mum's fecal matter on the way out so the baby most babies are born facing the mum's bum so it's likely to get a good lick or a good kind of good chew of the mum's poo if there's any kind of fecal matter poo and you know what it's like births are messy 
and there's quite often poo around which is a brilliant thing because then the baby kind of can um needs those exposed the mum's poo is a is like a direct line to um quite the baby acquiring the mum's gut microbes which are being kind of um uh, developing in you know during during the, her pregnancy so the baby swallow those gut microbes so you've got vaginal microbes you've got um uh fecal matter microbes or gut mo microbes you also have microbes from the air when you, when you breathe um you have skin microbes from skin to skin you also have microbes in breast milk and then uh so that's the kind of so all of those go down into the baby's gut and start colonizing it but they're hungry these microbes they need to be fed and so um, within breast milk are these uh, special sugars they're indigestible sugars called human milk oligosaccharides every single person on the planet this is my mission is going to, going to be able to say human milk oligosaccharides i love it took me a while now i've mastered it i want everybody to be able to say this with confidence human milk oligosaccharides say it with me human, human milk Milk oligosaccharides. Oligosaccharides. <laughs> there you go. So, so those human milk oligosaccharides, they, they're the, the special sugars that feed those microbes, those beneficial microbes in the baby's gut. Um, and so that's what these, helps. So basically these are sugars, as you say, that are not digestible for humans, but they're no. digestible for microbes. And exactly. you know, nothing happens in, in mother nature by mistake you know, things are planned. So the fact that the um, breast milk has that present, what's its purpose? Well, that's its purpose. And yeah, it's fascinating. Well, but it's, you know, so breast milk is incredibly important. So the scientists mm -hmm. would say that human milk oligosaccharides have probably have multiple reasons, m multiple things they can do. Um, and about 1% of the human milk oligosaccharides pass in to the, into the, into the body. So pass in through the, into the gut, into um, so the HMOs, so a small proportion, most of the microbes, most of the HMOs feed the microbes, but some pass into the body and they can affect all the body systems. So it's just this amazing, complex, uh, comp full of components and uh, immune components and uh, nutrients within breast milk. Um, and so this, so once, once fed by the HMO sugars, say it with me HMOs, um, then they, those microbes quickly colonize the infant gut. And that's really important because they're the microbes that are gonna train the infant immune system. So we're gonna train the infant immune system to identify what's a friend to be tolerated, what's a foe to be attacked. So what's friend and what's foe. And it's the microbes in the infant gut that trains the infant immune system fed by the sugars in breast milk. It's amazing, it's amazing. Right. and. Um, so much of the, my understanding is, that, you know, you have a much deeper <laughs> understanding than I do, um, but that, you know, that, that's that whole important part of the importance of that colostrum in those first couple of days is that if the baby has, has yet to develop the microbes that are going to assist with part of digestion of full milk and, you know, what it needs in that first couple of days, like all mammals receive colostrum, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a, a goat or a human, um, you know, we all have that colostrum at the beginning so that um, you've got so that we don't get hypoglycemic. So the baby still has that blood sugar that it needs and the sugars obviously to feed the microbiome, um, but it also has that time to develop that microbiome. So when the milk, full milk comes in, you know, two or three da days down the track, that gut has, has been, that gut environment has been, you know, created. How, and I guess your research that you're doing it's just adding weight to all of that information as well. The, the importance of the colostrum. Um, I'm not a researcher. I'm not a scientist. Right. I'm just a, 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 a conduit of science. <laughs> yeah. Well, the research yeah. you're aware of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, but it is. I mean, so colostrum is, is, has everything the baby needs for yeah. those, those first few days. It has absolutely everything. And it's packed for particularly immune components. So um, I, what I find a really amazing, so um, IgA, one of the sort of most important antibodies. So if a, if a mum gets ill, um, she develops, well, it doesn't have to be a mum, it could be anybody. If someone gets ill, they develop antibodies. And uh, so in response to the, the infection and 
those antibodies, those IG IgA are passed to the baby. And the baby, when it's born, doesn't produce IgA itself. It receives the IgA, those antibodies from the mum. Um, and so things like that within the colostrum, within, it's just this amazing complex mm. liquid, liquid gold, packed full of everything the baby needs. I mean, so, and so milk, so, you know, full mature milk, absolutely is wonderful and brilliant and fantastic and everything the baby needs but like doubly 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 just those first few days just so critical that um so tell us of the situation you know um with c-sections um antibiotics formula feeding i mean we we know that all of this is going to impact but you know how what how what's the research that you you're seeing um and how that impacts it's, 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 I guess it's, for the women who are in those situations that it's unavoidable i mean it's I mean, it's tricky and this is really sensitive because sometimes mm -hmm. uh, c-sections are necessary sometimes antibiotics are necessary sometimes formula milk is necessary mm -hmm. and i know some people are um very sensitive to this and i don't want to trigger anyone's guilt or anything else it's just kind of informing them this is what the science is saying wow. so if you if a baby is born uh through the abdomen rather than being born vaginally so um is born by c-section and if the waters haven't broken so if the amniotic sac is still intact at the time of the surgery then the baby is likely to not have acquired the full set of the mother's vaginal microbes because the baby's not going through the vagina and the waters haven't broken um, similarly, the, the baby is not likely to acquire the mother's gut microbes because the mother is not coming in anywhere near the mother's gut. And in fact, in, sur in, in surgery for a C-section, you're likely to be like cleaned all over and not have anything <laughs> just because that's the nature of surgery. They want a kind of sterile environment. So the scientists have, um, have discovered that babies born by C-section can have an altered gut microbiome when compared to vaginally born babies. And there's increased risk of uh, certain non-communicable diseases. So the causality hasn't, proved, hasn't been proven as in, you can't say, oh, they had a C-section that causes these diseases, but everything is in place to say, this is a really strong hypothesis. It's, it's all heading in the, the same direction. So a, a, a baby born by C-section is more, uh, it's increased risk of asthma, allergies, obesity, diabetes, celiac disease. So mostly an, um, anti-inflammatory type diseases. Mm, how interesting, um, yeah. Because the, um, and the hypothesis is, is that the baby's immune system hasn't been optimally trained, hasn't been correctly trained by the microbes the baby would have received if they'd been vaginally born. Um, same goes for antibiotics. So antibiotics um, means, I think, anti-life. It's, it's kind of anti, um, uh, anti-microbial life. Mm. And so antibiotics kill microbes. And if a, ba if a mother is given broad spectrum antibiotics, it's going to kill a broad spectrum of microbes. Um, so, uh, so the research is there that indicating that babies born by antibiotic, uh, babies given antibiotics or exposed to antibiotics, during the perinatal period. So if a, if a mum tests um, positive for group B strep and is given antibiotics during, uh, yeah, antibiotics during labor to prevent newborn uh, GBS infections, then that baby could be exposed to those microbes. Um, similarly, so babies born by C-section, sometimes the, the mum is given um, preventative uh, antibiotics to prevent infections. Similarly, with um, formula feeding, so formula feeding can affect the, um, can alter the gut microbiome. There's, there's research which suggests even one bottle of formula can, can affect um, the baby's gut microbiome. So all these things. That's, that's the thing is that it's, it's saying it's permanent effect. You know, we could all, all I think, probably go, well, yes, it, it's going to affect it while the baby's digesting that particular meal of formula. Um, but the idea that it's impacting them lifelong is, that's huge. That, well, it's a, and, the and now that science is showing that. 
well, it's just research is showing that it can affect for up to six months or up to a year. So C-section can affect up the baby's microbiome from up to a year. Uh, antibiotics, I think, is about six months. I think the same for formula. But the thing is, the, the immune training needs to happen sequentially. So certain right. microbes need to arrive at a certain time in a certain order. And if you disrupt that order and if you disrupt the sequence, then this could have consequences for your immune system. So even though um, a baby born by C-section might have a very similar microbiome to a baby born vaginally after a year or after two years, the, the, the hypothesis is that the baby's immune system has still been affected during that critical, right. or definitely kind of six month window after being born. So tell us about, um the way that that can be, what can we do differently that can impact it for women who are needing to have to have a cesarean or um, are needing to have antibiotics for something else. So what can we do that can make a difference? Uh, okay, exclusive breastfeeding, hands up, you know, uh, colostrum, exclusive breastfeeding, as much support as possible. Um, I mean, there's uh, immediate skin to skin. So if a woman's having uh, a C-section, if possible, um, you could have a woman friendly cesarean where the baby's placed directly onto the mother's chest um, immediately um, after, birth, after birth. And that means that I think it's the cannula put in the other hand. Um, mm -hmm. And so the measures are all around kind of keeping the mother and baby together. Um, and to keep and to protect that kind of mother baby sort of bubble for as long as possible. Um, so that's the sort of strongest evidence that, that skin to skin and, and exclusive breastfeeding helps. There's the research into swab seeding. Yeah, I was which, going to say with this vaginal swabs. So yeah, so vaginal that. swab. So uh, Dr. Dominguez Bello is still researching it. So it's been sort of studied all across the world. Um, actually, the, the full results of the study hasn't been published yet. So this is when, um, a, for a baby who's born by C-section, a, a, a swab is placed inside the mother's vagina prior to surgery. And then an hour before the surgery, the swab's taken out. Um, and then immediately after the baby's born, the, the, baby's, the baby's mouth, <clears throat> um, mouth, face and body is wiped with a swab from the vagina. And the, um, the the results of the small study say this partially restores the infant microbiome, but there are risks involved um, if the mother tests positive for group B strep or is at higher risk of group B strep. Um, there is still a, a subject of ongoing research. The full results haven't been published yet. It's not recommended anywhere, but but yeah. there yeah. is there is something. Yeah. So in the last there is in the last month there have been has been some research from Finland which. Um, has been looking at swab seeding with the mother's poo effectively so um to take in a little bit portion of the mum's poo mixing it in with her breast milk and then giving it to the baby so this wow. is a small so this is a small proof of concept study from finland mm. um uh so i think it's only like 14 babies so it's tiny 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 so the full results haven't been published yet same caveats not if um if if there's a risk of group b strep or if there's um uh there's you know strict protocols for their for their inclusion protocols the mum's poo is 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 delivered as in she does a poo three weeks beforehand and the, then the poo is analyzed to make sure it's free of pathogens all of that stuff anyway so the baby's given this uh fecal milkshake uh, uh, and it works, as in in this small proof of concept study, uh, it shows that the baby's microbiome more closely uh, matches a um, vaginal birth. So that could be something, not yet, because it's still right. on, same as swab seeding, it's like not yet, but um, I think that could present that together with swab seed, some, some sort of combination in the future, right. you know, so could be something. Okay, so the um, the the fecal milkshake, I hadn't heard <laughs> of. Um, the the uh, vaginal swabbing, I definitely sort of heard of that. So that I, I find it interesting. So that's not really um, out there at the moment as saying this is a good thing to be doing. It's just still in that research mode. Um, 
and probably as you say you know in a, a few years from now we'll realize that both of them both aspects are important and um now somebody's asked a, a good question i guess you know we do have those babies that are born with their membrane still intact um which of course is you know it means good luck um so i wonder what a, what what's the situation there i mean they don't happen that often um but when we we do have a baby with membranes intact uh okay so brilliant question i haven't seen a single study published anywhere that's looked into it anyway yeah. so if you if anyone's watching this <laughs> doing study, please 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 study this I, I think it'll be amazing so so all you can go on is uh is kind of best guess this is yeah. my best guess right so yeah. if a if a baby if the baby's born and the amniotic membranes are still intact then there may be some pre-seeding so within the in the womb there might may be some small exposures which sets up the immune system that's what i mean so you know so that's what i talked about earlier so there may be whilst the baby's developing the womb there may be possibly right. scientists don't know yeah it's a subject of debate so after, so if the baby's born vaginally, and then if depending where the where the baby is brought up, if the baby is delivered straight onto the baby's chest, and then the amniotic sac is ripped open, and if the mother is covered in all those vaginal juices and uh, fecal matter and all that kind of like messiness of birth, and if it's yeah. all over the mum's um, abdomen and chest, and then the baby, you know, you've seen a kind of breast crawl where the baby kind of crawls up the mum's chest and it's licking and sucking and yeah. all of that, then then that baby would likely, again, best guess, um, would acquire those mum's vaginal and faecal microbes just by being on the mum's oh, chest. Yeah. Mm. If the baby is born on call and then taken away to another table where, they, where the, the sack is opened, and then is kept away from the mum for however long, um, you would expect that the baby would not have received the full set of vaginal and gut microbes, mm. just because uh, where they're going to get them from. Yeah. That's my best guess. Please, if you're watching this, research it. <laughs> we'll send it to your friends. Yeah, or... you'd, you'd have to do a study, a some sort of worldwide study that everybody knows. Oh, I've had a baby born in the cold. Quickly, we'll do that. We'll participate in that study because it is quite rare, you know. And um, it, it's possible to go your entire midwifery career and not have one. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I get this right that we're not going to really know. It is all just hypothesis on on how that would impact. Um, you might, so, might be able to do a, 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 a study after the fact. So if you know a baby's yes. born by, in the call, and then you look at all the kind of babies born in call, so you could do a study. Yeah, say, do a retrospective. Uh, exactly. Um, mm. You know, I'm not a scientist. I don't know kind of how difficult that would be, but it's not out of the and realms. Knowing, of as you say, what happened to that baby at the time? Where was the membranes broke? You know what what happened in that first sort of few minutes afterwards? Um, where did the baby go, and what happened to it? But also, if the, if the mum had been exposed to antibiotics at any point, yeah. you know, so or whether whether the baby was um, um, exclusively breast, like really exclusively breastfed, as in no formula whatsoever. So all of that would need to be studied. So there's um, going back to the subject of group B strep. There is um, there's differing opinions around the world, uh, different cultures that are happen in, in hospitals as with regards to how quickly after um, membranes rupturing that women should start to receive it. You know, some are like, oh, it needs to be within 18 hours, other 72 hours. You know, there's different protocols that are used around the world. Um, do you have any thoughts or opinions on those differences? Uh, we've created a whole course on group B strep and uh, it's a 10 hour course. And it looks at the regulations in five different countries. So UK, right. New Zealand, Australia, America, and Canada. Um, I, I do not have an opinion on which system is better, just because okay. it, honestly, it's so complicated. And each, each country has their own set of regulations. Um, and yes, I think, it, I think 
uh, some, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think groupie strep is a real tricky one because um, the there's a very the risk of a child. So if a if a child is is exposed to um, group B strep um, during the birth process from a mum whose vagina or gut is colonized by group B strep, and so that baby has a small chance of developing a, a, a serious infection, mm. and but there is a small chance, a very, very small chance that baby, that, that infection could be fatal. So I think it's a really serious, um, something to consider. And I think, uh, gosh, I mean, that's why we did the whole course about it. So I, right. I, I don't, I don't okay. stray so into that. There is no, you, yes. Yeah, so that's interesting that you haven't ended up um, forming an opinion that you sort of think, oh, I think that's leaving the antibiotics too late, or I think that's earlier than it needs to be, or um, that, you know, because we, we do have s such different policies in different worlds, and even within the same country, but within different hospitals, and, um, you know, that, that's pretty tricky when it's, <laughs> we're trying to do best practice, but it's like nobody knows what it is. Um, yeah, so that's interesting that you haven't ended up creating and forming an opinion on what you think is the best protocol for managing that risk factor. I can. I've, I've looked at the science, as in looked at, um, like read all the different papers, and uh, just that even papers they kind of they're conflicting, um, like findings. I think it's such a a tricky um, field to navigate that. Yeah, I, 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 I have my own personal thoughts. If I had, if I was pregnant and uh, I tested positive for group B strep, what would I do? But that would be my own informed choice right. ideas. Okay, well that's it's so fascinating. Um, so we've got a few questions that are coming along here. Um, what about water birth? How would how does that impact microbes? Okay, so like um, uh, being born on in on cool. Um, there's been very little research into babies born in water or labouring in water and how this infects the infant microbiome. Mm, so, so it far, dilutes it or it, whether it so does, there's two doesn't studies. dilute. So there's two studies that have been published. One was published um, by Fehevue in 2004, which was, um, they swabbed the, um, I think it's the ears and the mouth to see if that, that was affected by water birth. And they found no differences in the, and the water didn't affect it. But this was before next generation sequencing. Uh, so a study by uh, Kombalik and, and Tal in 2000 and I think it's either 2018 or 2019. She found that um, there were minor differences in the uh, beta diversity. So within microbes, you have alpha diversity, which is the main microbes, main types of microbes. Then you have beta diversity. I'm, I'm really simplifying, but um. Uh, so beta diversity is the kind of like less, uh, more subtle um, changes. So she did find changes in the in the microbiome being born in water. But that was, again, very small study. There needs to be a very large, again, if you've got, if you're so, what is subject to study, please study this one. Um, because mm -hmm. I think it would be really so important for so many very informed choice for mothers all around the world who want to have water birth. So, um, you know, so water birth is brilliant. It's got, it's got so many benefits and uh, it helps pain relief and it helps, you know, the, the satisfaction of mothers is really high who have water birth, but whether or the extent it affects the infant microbiome is still not known. Um, the other thing, I, me personally, again, my best guess is that uh, chlorine is often used to clean out water pools and some public health systems add chlorine to their water chlorine kills microbes so if you're <laughs> if you're giving birth in a pool with chlorinated water that has been cl cleaned by chlorinated products to kill microbes can that affect the infant microbiome as in and also if um being born you might have exposure in to vaginal microbes coming through the birth canal if, if you're laboring for a long time but what if your poo floats away <laughs> in the birth pool mm -hmm. and the midwife just scoops it up? Mm -hmm. What's your contact with fecal matter? You know, so, uh, <laughs> I mean, if you're covered in poo on your chest 
and you're and the baby's put onto your chest and you're covered in your own poo, which is possible, then yes, you're still the baby will still have those exposure to those gut micros. But again, that's my best guess. I don't know. So fascinating that you know there's a whole lot of people out there that we're hoping that uh, want to do a master's and have just decided that this is what they'll study. <laughs> Right. Good, good. So we can find this information out, as you say, with retrospective studies. Um, so another couple of questions that have come along is um, if a baby is given probiotics after being born via C-section, does that help to seed the gut um, and give them a stronger immune system? Any thoughts on that one? Uh, so this has been researched at the moment and um, there's good evidence so far again pre preliminary studies which suggest mm -hmm. that bifidobacterium longum subspecies infactus which is a particular type of bacteria um, it's it's been identified as a champion gut colonizer so um, probiotics that contain that particular microbe evidence suggests this could be helpful in um, colonizing the so you add this particular the way they do it, this we we filmed this at the University of uh, California in Davis. So you have this probiotic; it's put onto the mum's nipple. So the probiotics is mis mixed with the mum's breast milk and then swallowed by the baby. And because it's got the HMO sugars in breast milk mixed with the bacteria, then uh, there's evidence, preliminary evidence, that this can be helpful. But which particular, say, the, say the name of that particular bacterium again. Bifidobacterium longum subspecies okay. infantis. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, is, so that's the same as the L bifidus? No. No, different again. So, okay. So, so that's the thing. So bifidobacteria, there's loads and loads of different types of those. Right. Um, and it might be that, <laughs> so that might be be specific to a certain type of mother in that particular area that is beneficial for. So it might be that um, that naturally a mother's gut or, or vagina um, has a different type of microbes that would thrive. Right. Like the, so we're talking about like, regional microbes basically as well. Exactly. Yeah. So, so some oh. scientists would say that say bacteroides um, is a, which is a different type of, ba of bacteria. They might be a kind of a really good, uh, you know, um, a, a kind of a good one to add to the baby's gut. Don't know. It's, so okay. it's still. So the, the still, problem at the moment is that um, if if a mother decided to do that herself um, and give some probiotics to her baby um, after it was born by C-section, what we don't even know really is, uh, I mean, were they the right particular microbiome that's the the particular gene so that you want that they that the baby is going to benefit from i guess it's a bit there, tricky, um, there are there is some sort of um a kind of a moves at the moment to uh to i don't know to sequence a mum's gut yes either prior to pregnancy or during pregnancy so you kind of know what what bacteria that the baby would have received Right. You see that. Okay. So, because if you, if if a mum's exposed to back, um, antibiotics, then the, so it has to be kind of an antibiotic free, back, um, microbiome. If you see what I mean. So, so she right. sequenced it beforehand, and so that could be a kind of an avenue. So it's kind of personalised to the mother, the probiotics that you might be giving your baby. But that's not here yet. Right. We don't so, know that okay, so what yeah, about so, a woman having uh, taking pro probiotics themselves during their pregnancy? Do we know if that how that may impact uh, infant microbiome? Um, again, it's being studied right now, but right. yes, that okay. that could be something. So if the mum takes the probiotic during pregnancy, then the gut. Um, but the thing with probiotics is that uh, once your gut stabilizes, which is somewhere between age one and three, your 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 gut microbiome re remains relatively stable, which means that even if you take probiotics, they probably won't stay around in the gut. So if you take one right. set of probiotics, 
then your body will probably just flush them out. So, <laughs> so it, it's likely that if you're taking probiotics, you'd have to take them every day. Yeah. You know, so, and then are they what your, because everyone's got microbiome is unique. Are they what, you know, so the scientists we would film, we've, we've been filming would say probiotics potentially can be helpful if you have a particular disease or you have a certain condition because they might, the, the microbes that within the kind of probiotics, that could be, that could help your body systems. Thing is, what might work for one person might not work for another person. Right. So we take, um, I take a, um, a probiotic every day um, and I love it. I find that my whole body work system works brilliantly. <laughs> but that, that works for me and I've tried other ones and nothing. So you're right, yeah. And all sorts of different brands have different combinations, and yeah. So it's we're just so on that cutting edge of realizing that, you know, the the more that we learn, the more we don't understand. Um, and I know myself when I was a um, a research midwife at um, Auckland University, and that was we, the, the study we were doing was completely different topic, but that was the thing that came through the whole time is the the more we learn the more we go oh okay that we the more we learn but the more we don't know because you don't understand why did that happen and um you sort of answer one question and create five new questions <laughs> right which is obviously what this is doing as well somebody's asked um i'll just read her question how about oral antibiotics for preterm pre-labor as uh, shrom so spontaneous rupture of membrane um is it worth it can bacteria build up again it depends mm. how it depends what the antibiotic was how, and what whether it was a, a broad spectrum antibiotic how how quickly it would be how long you know so it's all mm. sorts of questions in that one so what's the antibiotic yes. and what's the dose of elf antibiotic um, how long was it given before the baby was born? Um, preterm babies are a, a, a special one because they have, they're, they're so vulnerable to infections and I wouldn't want to give or say anything about them to That's be honest. Right, because we had, yeah. Um, and um, the, and Mil um, Melisabi who asked, asked that question was just qualifying that she's talking about. 250 milligrams um, four times a day of erythromycin but of course I don't imagine that we've got that level of study yet that we would know I mean what because I guess the only way to compare um, you know taking it or not taking it is the idea that we would give that we would not give some babies this you know who's going to want to participate in that study of sort of and who's going to get an ethics committee to approve it and saying hey we'd like to give 50 percent of the babies no antibiotics so let's see if it harms them you know so oh. yeah that's just that's a problem isn't it with some of these studies that we we can't do that double blind trial because it becomes unethical especially when we're talking about premature babies so we have to sort of hypothesize so much of it um, and I guess maybe it would be a case of doing a study where you come across premature babies who, for whatever reason, did not receive the antibiotics. Maybe they were geographically remote or something and see, did that mean that they had a weaker or a stronger or what was the outcome? And, you know, it's so complicated, isn't it? Well, especially because everybody's microbiome is unique and it would have right. depended on the exposures the baby would have received if the baby was born vaginally or by c-section or breast you know if the baby was breastfed or formula fed or donor milk donor milk is a whole different kettle of fish too because right. <laughs> then uh you know how i was talking about human milk oligosaccharides yes. <laughs> so, um <laughs> They're personalized to the mother and they're personalized to the baby. So that kind of mother baby combo, you have the kind of the HMOs, which are just personalized to that, to that mother baby infant combo. So if you have somebody else's uh, breast milk, they're not going to have the same HMOs, which are going to, and the baby wouldn't have received 
though uh, the same microbes anyway through birth. So there might be, not be a match between the HMOs um, and the microbes the baby would have received at birth. So it is a whole complicated, um, not minefield, but it's it, but it's exciting. So it's a very, the, the point is it's developing science and hmm. what we know right now and what we're going to know in 10 years from now and in 30 mm. years from now, it's just going to be so different. And, um, you know, by the time our daughters have daughters kind of thing, that a lot of what we're talking about now will just be basic, you know, knowledge <laughs> that everybody knows, you know. Um, and so it is very, very exciting, um, you know, to talk about this pioneering knowledge and so much of what is being studied now could not have been studied um you know a few decades ago because we didn't have the technology to be able to study it so um we, we're going to need to wind up um but i'm just wondering if you can um tell us a little bit about your courses um and your tools and your res resources kind of what's next um down the track with um what you guys are doing there you and alex so we've created, um, and thank you for asking, um, we've created an online school um, offering uh, accredited uh, courses. So if anyone's watching this, come take our free course, go to microbiomecourses.com and it's a free course and you get um, one LSERP um, and one CBD hour. Um, and we've just tried to, in, trying to encourage people to, to take this course in order to, so it's free and it's an hour long and you, it's seven professors, all, all just, describing their research and uh, wow. uh just uh, just this this I'm, I'm on this mission to to communicate and to to engage people in, in understanding the science and reading papers is hard it's really really hard because the language is so specialized and what we try to do is just trying to translate it and, and put it into pictures <laughs> to make it simple to yeah. understand so put it into pictures have the, the these scientists describe their their science in ways that I understand. I'm not a scientist, so yes. they have to, if I can understand. Yeah, so if you understand it, then you know that the other views. And tell me, the obviously that um, one hour free course is designed for, you know, health professionals, um, birth practitioners, etc. cetera. But um, is it, uh, you know, do you get women who are pregnant also wanting to watch it as well? You know, they're gonna get benefits too. Uh, Great question because we're just about to launch our tools for parents. Ah, so we're, <laughs> <laughs> we've created a whole set of um, uh, tools and resources for parents. So they've got um, and for uh, so for health professionals to explain to parents about the infant microbiome. So right. you've got um, slideshows, you've got animations, um, you've got uh, fact sheets or info sheets, eighteen fact sheets, and all, of all aspects of, of the microbiome. Um, you've got uh, cheat sheet. I can't say it. Cheat, cheat, cheat. cheat. <laughs> uh, cheats. Um, and we've got games. I've, I've created these um, like uh, micro, infant microbiome bingo. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and quizzes. Is this all on your website for, for everybody? Uh, it is. Yeah, so microbiomecourses.com. So um, we haven't, so they're not available. So they're available for health professionals. We're beta testing at the moment. So um, come and be one of our beta testers. And the whole idea is that uh, try them out on parents, give me feedback, and then we're going to launch them um, to the world in January. So so come and be a beta tester. Come and join. A, come oh, and join us. So you would like to hear from our audience that they could come and participate in this um, research or putting it together before it. Wow, that's cool. Go for it, everybody. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> in fact, tomorrow um, you will, everybody who's watching live um, will get an automatic email tomorrow um, that will give you a link to watching this video. Um, but also there'll be information there about being able to contact Tony. So then if anybody does want to um, participate as part of that um, rollout, that'd be great. Wonderful. It's not it's not um it's not free we've just like load the price yeah. so, it's, so it's like a really 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 low price just in order to um because you you can earn money by uh, using these tools so it's like, like really really low price so um uh and then uh yeah oh, then yeah. we 
launch it properly in January. So come and be a beta tester, come and join our, and we've got 120 beta testers at the moment. So we've been using it. I've, they've been using it all around the world, using these tools just to, and getting feedback from parents and just saying, oh, this, um, and I've got two versions, one which is like gender inclusive language and one which mm -hmm. is like female only language. So we'll take it, oh, everybody's comments and feedback. So uh, yes, I'm, I'm uh, yes. We'd love you to come and it's fantastic. It's fantastic. And nice to be able to um one, you know, participate and one day look back and go, gosh, you know, I was one of the midwives that helped out with that trial in the way back when it was all new, you know, <laughs> and years from now. Look, that is just so wonderful and we're running out of time. But is there anything um we've missed, Tony, that you want to add in? No, but that, I um I just want to clone everybody. <laughs> I want to be able to just uh so people who get it yeah. and understand the infant microbiome just to to take that knowledge and start telling people just start because mm -hmm. change happens from the top and change happens from the bottom from the top um, I'm working on getting to politicians and hospital managers and you know policy makers but also I kind of want to change happens from from the bottom so I think there's a lot of things that happen which are antimicrobial at present and we need to empower parents with knowledge so that they start asking their health professional to help them help them you know do skin to skin and exclusively breastfeed so that's what I, that's what i'd say be cloned or at least go out into the world and spread, spread the word <laughs> Oh, that's fabulous. Hey, thank you so much, Tony, for your time. And um, it's just, you know, we're really grateful. And um, and you're doing an amazing job, you and Alex. So just like, just wow, just fantastic. Thank you so much for everything you guys are doing. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I look forward to hearing, hearing from everybody again soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And thanks everybody for um, attending today. You know, we appreciate your time because without having an audience, it's, we're just talking to ourselves in space. So um, it's just really great. And, you know, getting the really good questions coming through as well. So thank you for everybody finding the time to be here live today. Okay. And bye everybody. Thank you. See you.